Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the 16th Annual Women's Policy Leadership Institute. Um, thank you for joining us for our last panel of our program, uh, What's at Stake at Indian Country? What's at Stake in Indian Country? Um, an analysis on federal, state, and tribal policy. Um, I'll be your moderator this evening. Um, my government name is Danielle Vasquez, but everyone just calls me Danny. So feel free to just call me Danny. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I am an organizer for Montana Woman Vote. Um, I'm also a Leo son. <laughs> um, so, you know, do with what you want, you know, okay. Anyways, um, the Women's Policy Leadership Institute is a program of Montana Women Vote. Um, Montana Women Vote works statewide to <clears throat> engage low-income women and families, LGBTQ folks, two-spirit and non-binary folks, Black, Indigenous, and people of color and their allies in the democratic process as informed voters, policy advocates, and community leaders. <clears throat> um, we are grateful for our panelists who are going to share with us today about their work advocating for Indigenous rights on different policy levels. <laughs> Um, we hope that the information presented will inform your efforts in your own communities, and we look forward to staying connected with you as we work together to advocate pol advance policy that works for low-income folks in Montana. Um, before we get started, I, uh, I'm just going to go over a few um, like technical, technical logistics. Um, if you've been with us since the beginning of our program, you've probably heard this a lot, um, but for the people who have not, I'm just going to repeat it again. Um, so this panel is webinar style, meaning um, you are able to unmute your you um, you won't be able to unmute yourself without permission. Um, to request that you um, to be un unmuted, you can click the microphone icon in the bottom left corner or press six if you're on the on the phone. Um, you can also ask questions and talk with other participants using the chat or the Q and A functions, as well as the conference Slack workspace. Um, the Q&A will typically be reviewed during the presentation and then again um, at the end of our agenda. Um, you also have the option to turn the captions on or off and adjust the size of your captions by clicking the arrow key um, by the little CC button on the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have any questions or have any technical difficulties um, anytime, um, you can put them in the chat or you can also call um, our staff at 406 317-1505. Um, we will also be recording today's session. Um, so if you missed something, recordings will be provided on our website as long as our as well as our um, YouTube channel. Um, and then we'll also provide any kind of any materials that we um, reference during the session. Um, and at the end, we ask that you complete a short evaluation, um, evaluation of the session to let us know your thoughts. Um, and how we can improve. Um, and yeah, once you do that, you will be entered into a drawing to win a book um, written by our keynote speaker, Aubrey Gordon. Um, the book is titled, What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat. Um, if you all were able to catch her, um, her workshop last week, um, you know, you all know it was amazing. So um, it's a good book. I've heard good things. I have a copy of the book. I haven't read it yet. I will get to it. It's on my um, New Year's resolution list. So um, yeah, you fill out those evals because um, we do read them. Um, so yeah, um, so we got through all that. Um, so now um, just want to do kind of like another, uh, like a safety aside. So tonight we're going to be addressing, um, you know, an extremely important topic and um, it might bring up feelings of, you know, guilt and animosity and, um, you know, that it, that's just how it is. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can, um, you know, say really bad things. Um, so with that, there's going to be absolutely no anti-Blackness, no anti-Indigeneity, no bigotry of any, any kind. Um, if in the event that that does happen, you will be removed. So um, just putting that out there. Um, so yeah, um, like I, so our panel today is, um, focuses on indigenous issues in the framework of state, 
federal and tribal policy. Um, and so before we get into that, um, you know, there's just some things that need to be acknowledged. Um, so, um, you know, the land that we currently call Montana has a unique history with settler colonialism. And um, so those of you who are not indigenous or black must acknowledge that you are settlers on this land and that you and your families benefit every day from the past, current and present on and ongoing colonization and oppression of indigenous people. Uh, we are also gathering in February, which is Black History Month. And we here at Montana Women Vote, as you all should too, recognize the invaluable and incomparable contributions of Black people every month and take this month especially to lift up and highlight the leadership and excellence of Black people now and in the past. Montana has had many thriving Black communities whose history is often overlooked or purposefully erased. And, um, sorry. Um, yeah, and so on, you know, the topic of erasure, um, you know, that erasure of Black and Indigenous people and our histories um, is one of the main goals of settler colonialism. The violent and forced removal and erasure of Indigenous peoples was and is needed in order to take the land for use by settlers. So this state, this country, and the other countries on this continent would not and could not exist without their settler colo colonial foundations. Um, so like, like I mentioned before, settle, settler colonialism is not just a vicious thing of the past, but it exists as long as settlers are living on appropriated land and thus exists today. And I really just want you all to sit with that for a while. And if you're white, really sit with that and you think about that and you just ask yourself how you can be a better ally. I don't know how that is, um, but you know, just keep that in mind. Um, so I got through that. Um, I just, I had, you have to acknowledge it. I think when talking about indigenous issues, it is important you acknowledge the history for what it is. And um, yeah, so um, again, with this, um, you know, talking about indigenous issues, um, I also want to touch on another concept, um, what that's relevant and necessary for this discussion, and that is tribal sovereignty. Um, and so I'm actually going to put um, a poll up, um, and I'll just wait a few seconds. Um, you know, so what is tribal sovereignty? Cool, I think hopefully everyone was able to answer that question. Unfortunately, hosts and panelists can't answer. I tried answering the last poll and I couldn't, which was like, a bummer because <laughs> I actually knew the answer. Um, but yeah, so for everyone that said, um, I think it's D or A, B, C, D, E, all of the above, um, you were correct. Uh, and yeah, you know, congratulations, you know more than most state Montana state legislators do. Um, so yeah, um, I'm, nobody said it was a ban. I was like, maybe one. <laughs> Okay, sorry, back on track, sorry. I um, have a tendency to like derail stuff. I don't know, sometimes it's a good thing. Um, but anyways, um, so back to our panel. So um, yeah, tribal sovereignty is um, a tribe's inherent right to govern themselves. Um, and so I just wanted to share this quote um, from one of my readings back in undergrad. 
Um, it's from the handbook on um, like federal Indian law. Um, yeah, it's uh, by Felix Cohen. And um, it goes, you know, from the earliest years of the Republic, the Indian tribes have been recognized as distinct, independent political communities, and as such qualified to exercise powers of self-government, not by virtue of any delegation of powers from the federal government, but rather by reason of their original tribal sovereignty. And so, um, you know, on first contact, that was like one thing, you know, um, the interactions with European settlers, um, you know, they say like tribal nations were recognized as sovereign, like even at first contact. And so they've always had these rights. We, we've, uh, they, we, we've always had these rights. Um, we've had this political relationship with the United States um, government since, you know, first contact. Um, and then, um, so basically, yeah, um, basically, you know, tribes have the ability to govern and protect and enhance the safety and well being of tribal citizens within tribal territory. Um, and so this panel is really focusing on those relationships um, and that and and that end goal, you know, the, the safety and well being of tribal communities. I mean, because that what's the point, you know. Um, so um, yeah, I got all through all that. Um, there's just like some things I needed to just get out there. Um, just and then to just give you all like a kind of like a really surface level understanding of how policy works in Indian country. Um, because it is, I mean, this this takes like semesters like worth of talking and discussing and I did it in like three minutes. Like my tribal sovereignty teacher, Dr. Beck would be so proud, just kidding. Um, but um, anyways, with all that being said, um, it is my extreme honor and privilege this evening to introduce our illustrious panelists. Um, and I'm gonna do this in alphabetical order. So just putting that out there. And I'm gonna start with Jade Barr. Um, Jade's primary areas, primary areas of research and outreach focus on Indian country and the impacts of state policies and budget decisions including that of criminal justice, economic development, and education. She engages with the community to develop and advocate for ed equitable public policies. Jade is an enrolled member of the Northern Cheyenne Tribal Nation and a Crow descendant. She holds a BA in sociology with an emphasis in inequalities and social justice from the University of Montana. Um, fun fact, Jade also served a one-year term in the 66th Montana State Legislature representing House District 50. Um, Jade is currently living in Billings with her two cats, Louie and Nanook. Get up for, give it up for Jade. Um, and next, I, I'm going to introduce Gabriella Blatt. Um, Gabriella is a member of the Chippewa Cree tribe um, growing up on the Rocky Boy Indian Reservation. She is currently based in Washington, D.C., where she works as a legislative assistant in, an in, in Indian affairs for U.S. Senator John Tester. In this role, she develops and advances the senator's native legislative priorities and acts as a liaison between the senator and Native nations across the country. Gabriella graduated in May of 2021 from Yale University with a degree in ethnicity, race, and migration. Gabrielle, in her free time, Gabriella can be found making Spotify playlists and reading native literature. Welcome, Gabriella. And lastly, but certainly not least, Shelly Fiant. Shelly Fiant is a Bitterroot Salish mother of four adult sons, grandmother to seven, and great grandmother to one. She is the former chairwoman of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribal Council and served on tribal council on tribal council for eight years. Ms. Fiant currently, cur currently serves as chair of the State Tribal Economic Development C Commission. She obtained an Associate of Arts from Haskell in 1978 and later returned to the University of Montana to earn a business administration degree in 1989. She is an avid UM Grizz football fan, a gardener and beater. Her spare time is spent in the mountains with family and working on promoting food sovereignty. Welcome Shelley. Yeah, and I mean, welcome everyone. If 
everyone could give a virtual round of applause for our panelists. I mean, maybe even throw in some fire emojis. Like, these guys are awesome. And also go Grizz. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm, I've been real, I've, I'll be, I've been really nervous, but also really excited to do this panel. Um, and so, yeah, just really glad you all can, um, be here this evening. Um, so yeah, um, I guess first off, um, I, we can, you can go into like further, um, you can in introduce yourself in greater detail. Um, but, and then in addition to that, I just wanna ask, you know, what, what brings you to this work? Um, you know, what, what inspired you to get involved in state tribal policy, you know, federal policy, just policy in general? Oh, oh um, I don't know who wants to start. I could pick someone or you can. I can start since uh, alphabetically I'm first. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, there's really not much more to uh, say about myself. I've lived in Montana all my life, uh, spent summers growing up on the Crow Reservation. And besides Billings, I've only lived in uh, Missoula and Helena. So, um, what brought me to this work was actually, I, when I served in the legislature, I had gotten to know a little bit more about the work that the Montana Budget and Policy Center did and um, the individuals that worked there. And so I, I really admired them and loved, loved everything they did. And so when my term finished up at the end of 2020, um, I was kind of ready to check out of uh, politics for a while, so I didn't really follow the legislature in 2021 very closely, uh, gave myself a break, and then, um, let's see, some months later, I heard about the job opening for this position, and I thought this job would be perfect for me, this is exactly what I'd want to do. Um, I think it's like a great way to still influence policy, but without having to be a politician, which has uh, probably way too many stresses on its own. And so um, I applied and then I was able to make it through the round of interviews. And so here I am today and I was very, really, really happy about it because I get to like focus on just state tribal relations. and. You know, as a legislator, you're you're having to really focus on a lot more of um, issues and and be more general about them. So, um, yeah, uh, here I am today. Bonjour, everyone. Gabriella Indigenikas. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Gabriella. Um, again, don't have a lot to add on to. Um, about who I am. So I'll just start right off with what brings me to this work. Um, so um, as Danny said, I grew up on the Rocky Reservation and growing up on the reservation, I got to see firsthand a lot um, of the results of the policies that I now work with. And I think um, just like anyone who grows up in the res slash in an urban native community knows um, just how important those policies are. Um, and when I was um, getting ready to graduate college and enter the job market, I knew that I like someday wanted to go back and like work on these policies, like the big like, oh, like come back and help your community. Um, but I actually wasn't going to do that for a few years. I um, had like a big corporate job lined up out in Chicago. Um, but the night before I graduated, um, the senator's chief of staff reached out to me via email and like offer or said that they'd be interested in um, interviewing me for the job. And it was basic, um, basically like a like light off light went off in my head of like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and you'll be able to like directly work with tribal communities, which um, is always something that I thought that like you had to be like have like more experience or like be like just more, um, have more wisdom to do. 
Um, so basically had the interview and um, decided like then and there, like, oh, like I'm not going to Chicago, like I'll be in DC for the next few years. Um, yeah, that is essentially like why I'm not here. <laughs> Hestilu Pesia, good evening, everyone. I'm really thankful to be um, here this evening and share this time and space with you all. Um, as Danny said, I served on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribal Council for eight years, elected by the tribal membership. And then the last two, I was elected uh, chairwoman by my peers. And so going into that, it was 2020 and I had a 2020 vision I had a platform that you know for my people in our lands that I had um, thought about for a long time and prayed about and um, you know we kind of started off doing a strategic planning session and then gosh within two months the coronavirus pandemic hit so it kind of upended everything that we were doing, but nevertheless, we did accomplish a lot and we worked with the county, which was kind of unheard of um, in the past, um, that being Lake County. And so um, the first year I was elected to council, um, we were in the Montana State Legislature defending our water compact. Um, Montana's process is that you go through the state first. It's not like that in every state, but in Montana's, that's the process that the compacts must go through the state first and then the federal process. So it was really baptism by fire. We went to the Montana state legislature and the first round it did not pass. And I just remember going in there to testify and the um, balconies were just filled with uh, non-Indians who were just, hating on us you know and this process was a very open process you know the meetings were open to everyone and in fact at the time I thought wow where did 30 years go because that's how long it took to negotiate that and I kept thinking oh I need to go to those meetings I need to go to those meetings and before I knew it you know I'm on council and I'm trying to defend it um, so the other thing that happened my first year on council was CSKT acquired the FERC license for the former Kerr Dam, which was on our property. Um, and this was a, pro a project, I guess, that, that my tribe planned for for 30 years. Like we set aside money every year for 30 years to take over the dam. Um, and so the water compact and assuming the dam, I learned pretty quickly um, that you need to be at the table lest you be on the menu. And so I think that's true of, of any of these issues that we're gonna discuss is, um, you know, you just need to be there and you need to be educated about the issues. One of the lessons I learned in a previous job was there's always at least two sides to um, an issue if not more. And, you know, I mean, that's not to say that sometimes you won't encounter just pure racism, but you, you need to be able to learn enough about the issues to be able to understand the other views. So, you know, back when I was in high school, I, I kind of encountered that it was in the 70s. And we had a water rights issue going on with the Jim Naiman case, and it had to do with um, who owned the bed and banks of the Flathead Lake. And um, growing up in a small town of Arley, Montana, less than a thousand people, I never really um, encountered racism. I don't know if it was my age, and you know, I was just in grade school or what, but when I moved to Ronan, it was definitely a, a great divide there. And so I learned, you know, pretty quickly that um, I needed to understand where other people were coming from. So that's kind of how I got into this. Um, I guess was always advocating for the tribe, um, you know, just and then being also being of mixed blood. Um, my mom is not native and my dad was Salish. 
And so a lot of times I was put in positions to, to be that, um, that ambassador or the advocate or that bridge to help people understand. So that's something I've um, really embraced my whole life. So thanks. Cool, thank you. Um, you both, you, um, both Gabriella and Shelly, you brought up some really good points. Um, you know, anyone can engage in policy. You know, you don't have to have a degree or anything. Um, you know, because these, some of these policies, they're personal. They affect our lives, and um, you know, we need to be involved. You know, like Shelly said, like we need to be at the table, or we're going to be on the table on the menu. And um, yeah, so um, my next question is kind of like, it might be a little hard to answer, but um, I, I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna ask. Um, so right now, what do you consider to be the single most pressing issue facing Indian country right now and why? any takers? <laughs> I know it's kind of like a loaded question. Oh, go, yeah. Ahead. Oh, yeah, go. go ahead, Jade. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, well, there's just a variety of issues and a lot of them just interconnect and are probably equally as pressing. Um, I figured I would say that voting um, access and like the redistricting that's happening in Montana, uh, because voting is a fundamental right and it's one that's being infringed upon uh, consistently. And it's also fundamental to our very democracy. So I just like, think it's wise to stay abreast of like what's happening with redistricting. You know, we just drew our congressional lines, but now we're doing legislative uh, redistricting. And so, um, you know, over the next year, they'll be drawing up those plans. And so I, I figure uh, I would say that it's good if people are going to try to, you know, uh, tune into some of those public meetings and um, oppose any legislation that comes next uh, session in 2023 that uh, could inhibit our right to vote. Cool, thank you. That's that's a really good one. Um, and yeah, so for, we actually had a workshop on voting rights and, you know, the state of voting rights right now in Montana. Um, and that's actually up on our website right now, um, a recording if you want to learn more about what the heck is going on in the voting rights realm. Because yeah, like Jade said, um, they are, voting rights are getting infringed upon. Um, so um, thank you. So I thought long and hard about this question and um, it is a really difficult one to answer. And I've been really involved in voting rights. Um, I sat in on all the Montana redistricting meetings and I actually got invited to, the, um, to meet with Vice President Harris and Secretary Holland to discuss voting rights in Indian country um, back in July of last year. And so, you know, I, I know that's a really important issue but one that's that's really on my heart um, right now is, um, you know, because I've been thinking about the people issues and the the land issues, and you know, with people issues, there's healthcare, mental health, addiction, homelessness, jobs, all that. With land, there's you know, like climate change, protecting our animals, the water our birds, our fish, you know, the very air that we breathe. And, you know, I always go back to our creation story that, you know, when the animals were getting this world ready for the humans, um, we were, as human beings, we were given the responsibility to speak for, for those who can't. And so I think, you know, it's, 
it's no coincidence that the missing and murdered indigenous relatives crisis and the very um, state of you know, climate change crisis that we're in, the biodiversity crisis, the social justice, all those crises together, not to mention the pandemic, you know, they're, they're all connected, they're all related. And I think as, you know, as women, we're keepers of the culture and, and we are the very life givers. And so to me, that's, to me, that's a very um, important issue in Indian country right now. So, you know, to protect us as, as women and as life givers is, is also parallel to protecting the earth. So that's, that's my answer. <laughs> I intentionally went last because I really wanted to see what Jade and uh, Shelly were going to say. And like both issues they mentioned are like happening um, right now on like the national scale, like the Kill Bill sirens were just going off in my head. Um, but I'm going to cop out and use my Gen Z answer of um, just like, I think climate change and um, like the ecological destruction that we're seeing right now is a large issue that is um, primarily being ignored and has been being ignored ever since like, I remember like being a child like these conversations were happening and we're still at the same um, level of like nothing being done. Um, but in terms of how this relates back to Indian country and like, it's very like, we think that it's obvious, um, just like the image of like polar bears or like rising temperatures that we are bombarded with. But when that, we also like look at it at like a deeper scale, the like little things of like, us being able to practice like ceremonial fire bur burning, like when our tribes have to do burn um, permits or limits because of um, drought and rising temperatures in the summer, that's an infringement on sovereignty. Our ability to, um, I brought this up a lot last summer specifically, um, but one of my like biggest memories of being a little kid on the res is going to go pick June berries. I'm not sure what they're called outside of Rocky Boy, um, but Exactly. <laughs> um, but when I was asking my mom, like, oh, like, did June berries come in season yet? Like, were there anything? She just like mentioned that nothing grew, like all the berries were dried up. And that's an infringement on our like right to our traditional food. And like, when we think of climate change, it's like, again, easy to think about like the big things of like polar bears, but we often forget about like the small things that make our, um, that our ancestors have practiced for years. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's the most, the single most pressing issue in Indian country, just because like without land, like what do we have? Again, Gen Z um, growing up in climate destruction, very fun. <laughs> no, those are all really good answers. And I actually didn't even, I didn't think of it. Like I, I didn't even think of like the berry thing because yeah, it is getting so hard to find berry spots and you know everyone's really cheap with like their spots and it's like it's climate change um so yeah um thank you all for sharing um and I know that was like a hard answer I did I, I didn't know how to answer that either because yeah that is hard <laughs> um but again yeah thank you all for sharing um and so yeah with this um next question um I really want to kind of dig into y'all's work, you know, your um, analysis on, you know, policy that you're working on or that you're seeing um, in your, um, you know, um, in your networks. Um, so, yeah, so I know it's like a big question, a loaded question again, um, but yeah, um, if you all can just kind of talk a little bit about changes that have happened um, in the past couple of years um, to, you know, any, really, I'm just gonna give, I'm just gonna give, um, you know, put it up to you to um, figure out how you wanna do this, but, um, you know, just, um, you know, give us an idea, just give us a snapshot of what is going on um, in regards to policy in your world. Um, again, I don't know who to start with. Um, 
I'll go first this time. Um, okay. So one of the issues that um, that I've worked on is the missing and murdered Indigenous people. And CSKT was the first tribe to develop a tribal community response plan. And basically that was a result of Operation Lady Justice in the last administration where um, they did all these listening sessions and they came out with four basic areas, kind of an outline. One was um, law enforcement, one was victim services, the other was public relations and communications. And then, um, oh, the other one was like community resources. <clears throat> so um, CSKT had developed a missing and murdered indigenous people's work group um, because of one of our own missing, uh, Jermaine Charlo. And she's the same age as my oldest granddaughter and her grandma and I have been friends forever. We grew up together. And so, you know, this is a really, um, really difficult subject. But um, so we developed that policy in-house. We were the first tribe to develop that plan. And um, one of the things that happened was we were approached by a gentleman named Rain Bear Stands Last. He came through the reservation and he was doing a documentary um, on some of the Montana cases. And the documentary that came out is called Somebody's Daughter. And um, it just highlighted you know, some of those reasons why people go missing or are murdered. And you know, there's, there's so many reasons but you know, some of them are the drugs, the human trafficking, uh, just the poverty, um, kids being in foster care, aging out, you know, that's a vulnerable group. Uh, there's so many things. So we developed this, or he developed this documentary to educate um, Congress about Savannah's Act and the Not Invisible Act. So those two acts were passed in. I think 2019, and at the same time, Hannah's Act was passed in Montana, specifically at the state level, um, to Hannah's Act actually um, created a missing person specialist um, in Montana, because part of the issue is just the whole jurisdictional nightmare, you know, was the victim, uh, on tribal land or not tribal land was the alleged perpetrator native or not native you know it's just so confusing um, so anyway that was Hannah's act and then there was the Savannah's act and um, the not invisible act now in the future um, one thing that we're trying to get past is um, the reduce return and recover act and that one will specifically address man camps and it will specifically address the um, container ships in the Great Lakes region where women are actually um, shipped off and you know that's where this trafficking occurs. So you know this is a it's not just a Montana problem along I-90 or on reservations, although we are one of the main targets um but back to back to somebody's daughter so that was the documentary regarding the cases in montana well since then rain has made another documentary called say her name and has to do specifically with uh hardin montana bighorn county being the epicenter of missing and murdered indigenous women um and so we just uh, screened those two films last week in Santa Fe, where uh, kind of a, one thing that came out of that somebody's daughter was the next step that we decided to do was in the area of prevention. So letting, um, I guess, 
letting our women and children know of the dangers out there in our communities at large, you know. Um, so we developed a curriculum entitled House of the Moon, and it, it deals with the medicine wheel, the, the uh, mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual aspects of it. So we developed this curriculum around that, and um, we had a pilot program during the pandemic, everything we had to do via Zoom. And so last week we got together in Santa Fe and it was our first in-person gathering since we started this in January of 2020. And so now we're in the um, next phase of developing um, the program further out. We had lessons learned um, and we're, our, I guess our end goal is to get a facilitator from every reservation and every reserve in Canada. So that's that's kind of where my efforts have been most recently. Um, since I'm not on tribal council anymore, I'm really trying to pick and choose where I devote my energy to. And so this is what it is right now is missing and murdered indigenous relatives. Cool. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, you you touched on something that I, I just want to um, talk about really quick. Um, jurisdiction. <laughs> jurisdiction is such a wonky topic because it's so complex. Um, and I'm actually going to share um, something in the chat. It's actually um, from the Montana Budget and Policy Center, um, which is such a great resource, just putting it out there. They do a lot of good work, a lot of good reports, but it's um, a report on jurisdiction, um, just to give you all an idea of just like the complexities of it and you know how it contributes to MMIP, um, MMIW. Um, you know, and it violence against indigenous women, girls, relatives is, I'm just gonna say, yeah, it's a direct um, link to settler colonialism. Every, every bad thing that happens to us, settler colonialism. I would share a meme, but I don't know if memes are allowed. Anyways, yeah, um, I put that in the chat, um, so. Um, yeah, um, I, before we move on, um, just have to ask, um, are, and do any of you work, are any of you like actively working on like anything related to, you know, the violence against Native women and girls? Um, I mean, if, it's a lot, there's a lot going on, but, um, if any of you want to say anything on that before we move on, um, because it is an important topic. Um, also very heartbreaking, um, so. Um, <clears throat> I'm not currently working on anything, but I could speak to just that last legislative session, they passed a bill to establish a missing persons review committee. And at the last uh, state tribal relations interim committee, they talked about kind of some of the issues that they've run into um, the point of this committee was to review um, previous cases where people did turn up um, just to try to like interview these people and maybe see if there was some sort of pattern um, they could catch to prevent things. Uh, but uh, they ran into some like constitutional like privacy issues, um, given that like 80% of them were under the age of 18, so they could not consent. Um, and they were worried about like potential court cases that could end up resulting from sharing their sort of information. There was also some like concerns around like uh, sensitivities of uh, bringing up past traumas, but they are um, going to continue to like look into a sort of system that would kind of allow for uh, like a paperwork system to allow for consent and, and work through it. So. I know that's where that is right now. I know they extended the Missing Indigenous Task Force and the LINK grant program. Um, for those who don't know the LINK grant, it was awarded to the Blackfeet Community College um, in March, 2020 to develop this website with uh, a reporting portal. 
as a way to begin the process of reporting anyone that's missing. So that's all I can say on that. Um, in my area, very exciting um, today, uh, it was announced that um, the bipartisan VAWA reauthorization dropped today actually. Um, and this is the first time that bipartisanship has come through um, to reauthorize VAWA in such a long time. Um, and this version of the bill, like fingers crossed, it passes um, the Senate and House, but it expands the um, special criminal jurisdiction um, that tribal courts have to um, cover um, non-native per um, perpetrators of sexual assault and violence, which is just like a huge win for tribal sovereignty and for native women. Um, it's going to do a lot of cool things. Um, yes, thank you, SJ, for putting the acronym in the um, chat. But yeah, keep an eye out on VAWA reauthorization in the next coming months. Um, very excited about it. That is really exciting. Um, I didn't know that. So um, yeah, actually, like VAWA was like my introduction to tribal sovereignty policy stuff um, back in undergrad. I got my undergrad is in social work and it's like in a policy class and that was actually the policy I focused on. So um, yeah, that that's um, it's exciting. Um, anyway, yeah, okay, I will shut up. <laughs> um, I can go next in terms of what's happening in my issue area. Um, I didn't explain this well earlier um, because ever since starting this job, I have a bad habit of talking in acronyms as y'all just saw. Um, but as a legislative assistant, I um, basically monitor legislation that is going through um, the Senate and House as well as conduct research and draft potential legislation um, and just like in general give advice um, on what's happening in Indian country to the Senator. Um, and so I started this job last July. Um, fun fact, my second day on the job, um, I actually, my bosses were like, oh, like you're going to meet with the chairwoman of CSKT. And so Shelly got to see me like when I didn't know where the cafeteria was. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, unlike 90% of the Hill, I didn't come in with any internship experience or anything like that. And so a lot of my time in the job this past year was just like kind of learning how Congress works, how bills are passed. Um, and in my role specifically, I spent a lot of time this past year um, introducing myself to the tribes of Montana and in our learning their priorities and histories with legislation. Um, and so my job, um, I cover like Indian country overall. And while there are some people in my office, like for example, we have a education legis legislative assistant and an environmental legislative assistant who like will work on like education in Montana or like environment and like land use in Montana. I do that for Indian country. So like I do like, there's nothing that I don't touch in the office essentially. <laughs> um, so I'm just kind of like all over the place. Um, and but the big thing this past year, and I'm about to sound like a CNN political correspondent, um, but this was Biden's first year, or when I started, it was Biden's first year, as y'all know. And so that shaped a lot of the legislation that I worked on, um, namely the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act and what was going to be um, the Build Back Better Act. And so I spent a lot of time um, learning and advocating for tribal needs in these bills, especially in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which my boss um, was one of the main senators working on it. And so I got to um, work very closely with the bill and see how it moved day by day um, in making sure that what was benefiting tribes stayed in the bill and making sure that Montana's um, tribal priorities were, um, again, like surviving as the bill moved through processes and everything. Um, and we got some good stuff for Indian country in this bill. Um, like 3 billion for tribal roads, 2 billion for broadband. And um, the biggest thing for Montana is the money for the Indian wa is money for the Indian water rights settlements um, to build out the needed infrastructure to actually um, pass like, or to like actually work on the compacts that uh, Shelly was talking about earlier. 
Um, and this includes the settlement for CSKT, which is the largest in history. Um, I can geek out about any water rights settlements all day, so we'll no longer bore you with those. Um, and in Build Back Better, um, the amount of times that I had to look through that like 4,000 page bill and just like gather what was in it for Indian country and like track the numbers as they were moving. Um, I like have like war zones in my mind thinking about it. Um, as the news will tell you, I'm not sure what where the future of that bill lies. Um, so we'll see, it's really just changing day by day. Um, but yeah, so just like the infrastructure bill, um, as well as introducing myself to tribes and like getting or establishing these relationships, um, which is a big thing that Senator Tester's office um, advocated for. Um, we really wanted to make sure that um, we work closely with tribes and like make sure that their um, priorities are represented in Congress. Um, and that's one of the, I think, better things about working in this tribe or in this job is that like, I think like you always see like big like politicians like saying they care about Indian country, but I like after working in this job, like genuinely like know that my boss really does care um, about these issues. And um, the cool thing is that like for states that um, have less than stellar um, representatives that work in Congress, um, they actually come to my boss a lot to like get help on moving their legislation. And so I've had the chance to work with um, not only just Montana tribes, but tribes throughout the United States. Um, and so like really, I am just thankful that I get to learn every day. Cool, thanks for sharing. Um, you wanna take, take it from here, Jade? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, part of my job is to follow the State Tribal Relations Committee, and they're, the, they're an interim, interim committee, and they act as a sort of, uh, well, as a liaison with tribal governments, and so they conduct interim studies. Um, they decide what those studies will be, and then they report their activities and findings to the legislature. Um, they are also capable of proposing legislation, uh, but I figured I'd just kind of touch on maybe what they're uh, following. Uh, they've devoted a fair amount of their time to looking at voting access. So, you know, they've recently been able to look at or were given like a history of voting rights in Indian country. Um, and then they've brought in uh, presentations from the Native American Rights Fund to give uh, a rundown of like the barriers of voting in Indian country. Uh, they've also brought in like county perspectives on how that's looking on their side. Uh, another large part of the time they spent is on the fee to trust um, conversion. Uh, so the committee has been given like a history of allotment and kind of where the fee to trust comes from, um, why the fee to trust can take so long and like the financial impacts of that, um, the tribe's perspectives on like what happens during that process and then also county uh, perspectives. And, and this arises out of the bill that was introduced last session by Greg Hertz uh, that would, that changed the tribal property exemption. So originally when land was being put into the fee to trust, the tribes could have like a five-year exemption to, to where they were not taxed, but this changed it to where if the tribes don't end up getting it transferred in five years, like say it takes six years, but they don't make it in five years, they have to pay back any of those taxes that happen. So that has been part of why they are wanting to look at that. Um, I don't know if anything will come out of that. Uh, hopefully something positive. Um, they're also looking at um, giving time to fixing this, uh, previous bill that I did sponsor in the 2019 legislature, and it was 
to get a updated report on the economic contributions in Indian country. And it was a decennial report. So the intention was to like update the report and fill in the 10 year gap because the last report was from 2003 to 2009. And uh, so when I introduced it, um, Department of Commerce uh, came in and helped and thought like, okay, so what should the appropriation be? And first set it at like $170,000 for this report. Um, but then the appropriation committee uh, reduced it down to like $48,000. And that ended up causing a bunch of problems once the bill was passed and um, they were trying to work on gathering the information uh, they had some trouble getting the data from tribes and COVID hit. So that just delayed a lot more um, of that being able to happen. But what's great about, well, what's important about this report is that it ends up showing just how much of an economic impact that the reservations have in Montana. Um, and the last report, I don't know if we were able to share it, um, already, but uh, it pretty much shows that tribes are bringing in like over a billion dollars. And it's important to point that out during the session because we have to fight like tooth and nail to get any money for any of the programs that we want funded. And we don't get nearly like a billion dollars in any sort of funding programs that we're asking for. So um so the committee is going to work on like kind of clearing up some language in that um and then hopefully like getting more money behind it they did think that it's actually going to cost more around like four hundred thousand dollars to complete this this report and then like hopefully we can set it up to where there's an entity that's familiar with working more with tribes and getting the data, along with like hoping that the tribal colleges could maybe take on the responsibility of collecting that data. Um, I think another important thing worth noting that the committee is gonna have presented to them is a history and impacts of the residential boarding schools on um, tribal communities. And that looks like it's gonna be at the next strict meeting in March. And there is not a set date on when that will be. Um, <clears throat> I'll also talk about uh, some of the other policies I'm looking at, uh, which would be broadband in Indian country. Um, there was a recent, there was a national survey that showed that uh, the net result of Montana on average had the slowest internet of all states and like had roughly half the speed of the national average. And since we are rural, very rural, you know, especially tribal lands being on rural area, they can lack broadband the most. Um, and as with most things, Indian country broadband access has been underfunded. And so um, last session, the legislature, had HB 3 or 632 and where they had to divvy up the like $2 billion of ARPA federal funds. And they allotted 275 million of that to go to a broadband grant program. So what's great about that is like tribes can partner with broadband providers and apply for this. Um, and so I've been working to try to like inform tribes on what's happening. And um, they recently opened up the application period. Um, so hopefully something can come out of that. Uh, let's see. Um, there was uh, like a national grant program called the Tribal Broadband Connectivity P Program um, managed by the NTIA, uh, the National Telecommunications Information administration and they put a billion dollars for tribes to be able to apply for this but the total amount of requests that 
that came in for this $1 billion program was around $5 billion. And so like the ex experts in this area of Indian country think that it's gonna be more around like $7 billion just to um, digitally connect most reservations. So, um, you know, that $1 billion is already gone. And the infrastructure and jobs bill is going to add like another $2 billion to that. But it, I mean, those are those funds are obviously already spoken for. And um, so I, I like I stress the importance of broadband um, because it's essential to the infrastructure because it interconnects all the other industries. So like schools, businesses, hospitals, like every industry relies on computing, uh, storage, cloud storage and other digital equipment to like distribute their goods. And in a pandemic that is disproportionately impacting Indian country, like accessing the internet has become a, a vital for maintaining and improving essential things like physical and mental health outcomes, employment rates, school enrollments, and like our social connections. Um, so I thought that was one of the most important things to study. And I could keep going about one more thing, but I think I'll stop there and let, let us go on. No, no, this is, this is great. Um, and thank you for sharing all this information. Um, it's really important. Um, but you, you mentioned um, one of my favorite legislators, um, I don't know if you, there's um, Greg Hertz. <laughs> um, and I, I guess like I have a question for Shelly. So, um, you know, Greg Hertz had it out for y'all over at CSKT along with um, Lake County commissioners. And I'm just curious um, where, you know, that bill is like at, um, um, sorry to, give you all kind of like some background. So during this last session, there was a bill that um, would affect the fee to land um, uh, process um, and like back taxes. Um, if you could just kind of speak to that a little bit. Um. Sure. Um, so the problem with our representatives um, on the Flathead Reservation is they don't represent the natives within the, the districts. And we've looked during the redistricting process, we looked at all those um, borders, all those lines to, to see if there was a way that we could get a majority um, native district. Um, and it, I mean, we're still in that process now, like that's the next process after we did the, the new um, house representative um, part of that. But, you know, bottom line is there is no communication with the tribe on any of these bills that were, that were brought forward on the um, fee to trust process. You know, we went there and testified that this, it's not our, um, we're not the ones holding it up. We bring it to BIA. You know, we go through that process, and we're not holding it up. It's the it's the BIA. It's the process itself. Um, but never have they communicated with us. The same with the um, the bill that Joe Reed brought forward about hunting on fee land within the reservation. That was never communicated to us, and we were like the last to know. And um, that was during a, a really um, uptick in our COVID cases. So I was just only able to testify via Zoom. And, but luckily Indian country turned out and, you know, had our back for us that time. So that was, that was really good to see. And, you know, I just want to thank the Indian caucus for doing that, that, you know, that was really overwhelming. So yeah, it's just a lack of communication. And um, I think that will never stop um, as long as we have, you know, all, all these non-Indian um, representatives and um, senators. So we do have one district 
which is a majority Indian district and it covers from uh, the Blackfeet Reservation down the um, east side of the Flathead Reservation. And so luckily we've had um, Marvin Weatherwax and Susan Weber to you know go to bat for us in that one in those two um, districts. So, you know, we, we hang on to those as, as best as we can, but it, you know, it goes back to communication. So when I became chair, I asked um, the Lake County Commissioner, the chair of the commission at that time, if we could start meeting. Um, and so we met, uh, probably every other week, like every two weeks, we would sit down and meet on a Friday and just discuss, you know, what was going on on the reservation. It started out, it was kind of a, a outcropping of our unified command team uh, process with the pandemic. And so we started meeting um, every other week. And one of the things that um, he's, that he, the chair of the Lake County Commission said just really opened my eyes was, uh, so as a unified command team for the pandemic, we would meet weekly. And um, as we were getting ready to open back up, because we were in a shelter in place situation, when we got ready to open back up and go back to work, he said, you know, I've learned a lot from working with the tribe. And he said, one thing I realized is how important your culture is in your decision making. And that got me right here because I thought, well, yeah, that's always driven our decisions. And he said, we don't have that. And so if you think about that, you know, if your county commissioners don't have a culture or um, I guess elders and youth, you know, to think about, you know, when I go back to my own family, I'm lucky enough to still have my mom and I have a great granddaughter. So, you know, we have five generations in our family and my family's always had five generations on both sides. And so I feel really lucky, um, very fortunate to have that and, and if you don't make your decisions based on your elders and your future generations, then and you're just living for um, today and capitalism and wealth and <laughs> accumulation, all that kind of thing. Yeah, it just goes back to the settler colonialism that you spoke about, Danny. So, you know, I think improved communication. One thing that I was approached with in the last month was, um, running against uh, Joe Reed in, um, on the reservation. And I am just not at that place in my life I can do that. Um, I, I would love to be at that table, um, you know, versus being on the menu that I preach, but I'm just not in, in a place where I can do that right now because of my family obligations. So I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, no, totally. Um, and I totally agree about, you know, kind of stepping back from being in just in, in it. Um, because I, yeah, I, I was approached too. And I'm like, I can't be a legislator. This mouth will get me kicked out. Um, but yeah, so thank you for sharing. Um, It's, yeah, so, I mean, this past session, um, I mean, if you were involved in it, if you sat in those committee hearings, you heard all of just the garbage, um, the hate that they spewed, um, you know, settler, like white supremacy, racism, it was all, is all there. Um, and it's, it's, I don't know, it feels, it feels kind of scary, you know, like this is our reality, this is our state legislature, legislature, um, and it's, 
it's a scary place to be sometimes. Um, and so I really, I really do um, appreciate, you know, those people who, who are in there every day fighting for tribal nations, tribal communities, because it's not a good place to be sometimes. Um, I mean, after the session, I had to take like, I mean, I still feel like I'm on vacation after that session. <laughs> um, also, sorry to my boss who heard me. Um, it's, um, yeah, but I mean, it's like I said, it's our reality. And um, I mean, again, if we're not at the table, we're on the menu um, and it's not changing. And so that's why, you know, we need people to be involved. We need people to, you know, reach out to their senators, their legislators, their representatives and say, hey, you know, this, this isn't working. Um, and I mean, even, you know, all the people on like sessions coming up faster than you think. And um, I mean, if last year, if this past year was bad, um, I mean, not this past year, um, 2021, like 2023 is gonna be really bad. Um, and I don't say that to like scare anyone. It's just, it's, I mean, it's the truth, um, so. But I don't wanna focus, I don't wanna like end on like something super depressing because we don't need that. Um, instead, I wanna just kind of end on like positive note. And so um, my kind of final question to our panelists this evening is, um, you know, if you had all the money in the world, all the resources, um, anything um what like big issue area would you address like what it could be a policy it could be anything um and I'm just going to go first because I I actually have a good answer for this question um and I talk about it all the time to anybody who will listen um I really want a little tiny home village I always see the posts um like other tribes are doing it and I want that for my community like tiny homes like housing is such a big issue where I'm from. Gabriella will agree. Um, I mean, you all, you probably other, everyone should agree. Housing on the res is not that great. Um, and so that would be mine. I would just like, everybody gets a tiny home. Like you get a tiny home, they get a tiny home. We all get tiny homes. So that's mine. <laughs> I'll go. Yeah, I um, when you gave us the question, I uh, gave us some thought and I was like, oh, well, I would want the decennial bill like funded. But then I was like, no, like, let's go big. And uh, this would be me speaking on uh, like my behalf and not like Montana Budget and Policy Center. But, you know, I definitely like to see our treaty rights honored and land back and our institutions and in Indian country fully funded. I'd like to see um, universal health care, universal child care, affordable housing, free community colleges, and reparations made to BIPOC communities. Um, Jade, save some for the rest of us. <laughs> um, I think my big thing is, um, again, speaking from my own, um, experiences growing up on the reservation and then like leaving it for university, um, investing in um, all forms of education for our native youth and native college students. Um, I think I would definitely like my dream um, for context. I um, went to school off the reservation in high school just because um, my school my um the school i was going to at the time um didn't have a science teacher due to um just an absence and of um teachers in the area and i just think it's so important and like i still push on it today um when i talk to um native youth like the importance of getting an education um and like i just like wish that i and like so many other like native students like didn't have to um like have to leave our homes in order to do that. Um, and also just like now, like I wish that there were more opportunities for like native students and native youth to learn about like traditional plants or their language and like all the other like 
traditional forms of knowledge that we like lost, but like now like need a chance to um, refine. And also just like the importance of tribal colleges and universities, which like have been making amazing strides in language revitalization and also like forestry and um, conservation programs. Um, so yeah, um, and I guess as the old saying goes, like uh, feeding the res dogs is my second one. Yeah. <laughs> So for me, it's two things. One, and Jade already mentioned land back. Um, you know, if we were to get, you know, even a fraction of our, our traditional territories back and be able to restore buffalo, restore salmon, um, then we would have total sovereignty, true sovereignty, because a nation that cannot feed itself is not truly sovereign. And when our traditional food um, systems were interrupted, um, that was where it all began, you know, uh, with the reservation area era and, you know, us not being able to go hunt our buffalo and instead being given these awful rations that, um, you know, are still foreign to our systems. You know, I think about my, my great grandma, she, you know, subsisted on traditional foods and, you know, game and fish. And when they introduced flour and sugar and lard and all that stuff, you know, that's, so I'll just give you an example. My great, great grandma lived to be 112 and pretty sure she never had any of those foods or alcohol. My great grandma lived to be 82. My grandma died at 57 and my dad died at 50. And so when you look at that and how our food and our life ways, you know, the, the uh, foreign foods and then just the lack of physical activity that came with that, you know, us not going to the east side to go hunt buff, well, us not going to the coast to fish, you know, um, started by that reservation system, um, you know, that is what's contributing to our health disparities and, you know, us living 20 years less than our white counterparts in Montana. So land back definitely is one thing. Um, the other thing is, and, and it's related to that is, you know, just our reliance on fossil fuels. You know, it's killing us, it's killing our earth. And when I think about what's going on with, um, you know, like in Oklahoma, the fracking and, you know, what happened in North Dakota, you know, with just all that extraction, you know, it's, it's, it's killing our earth and, and it's, you know, hurting our people as well. And, you know, it's just, um, kind of a breeding ground for missing and murdered indigenous relatives as well. So yeah, land back and then getting um, off of fossil fuels, whatever that takes, if it's renewables, if it's, um, you know, just us not being so dependent and so relying on capitalism. So, yeah. I just want to say, I just want to give a shout out to Jade and Gabriella for doing the work that you do. You know, I really appreciate the Indian Caucus. I prayed for you guys every day of the session because you guys were our warriors, you know, every day. And, and people like, um, you know, Western Native Voice and Montana Women Vote, um, ACLU, Montana Budget and Policy Center, all of our allies out there, you really did a lot for Indian Country. And then, you know, Gabriella, you at the um, tester's office, you know, I feel really hopeful seeing you there. So thank you. Yes, like same, like all that. I, this is like so empowering. Um, someone put that in the chat. I'm like, I'm gonna start crying right now. I'll try not to, cause that's awkward. Um, <laughs> um, but yes, thank you all for sharing all of this, um, you know, the work 
the work doesn't end. Um, and it's like a thankless job, what you all do. Um, yeah, and so um, I, I guess like right now we have a couple minutes for questions if anyone wants has questions. Um, and if you all have like anything you wanna share, like any kind of events coming up um, that you know you wanna share with our attendees or any kind of you know reports or movies, books, podcasts, like all that, we, we love that. Well, I do, I don't wanna speak for the pe other people, but um, yeah, um, this, this was great. Um, and thank you all. Uh, yeah, I'll add, uh, yeah, thank you all, too. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here amongst everybody. Um, I'll add that uh, MBPC is putting, they're going to have our annual state travel symposium this fall, but um, that is still TBD. And I also wanted to give a plug for uh, the Greater Yellowstone uh, Coalition are partnering with the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes. Um, and they're hosting a free online intertribal gathering on March 1st, 2022. March 1st marks the 150th anniversary of Yellowstone National Park, which was designated in 1872. But as we know, before it was a park, the lands were lived on by a vast array of indigenous people. Um, and today, dozens of tribes still have ancestral connections to the park. And so this event would really be about elevating tribal communities' voice and envisioning, envisioning the future of the park. And it looks like the link was shared in the chat. Thank you. Cool, that sounds awesome. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention um, earlier when I was going off on settler colonialism, um, like I think yesterday was actually like the anniversary of the Dawes Act, Ooh. Um, I think it's like 130 years um, and they're still trying to take our land. Like, geez, don't you take enough? <laughs> no, but um, yeah, if anybody, if there's any attendees that are rich and white and have some land, give it back. If you have friends that are rich and have land, tell them to give it back. <laughs> um, what was that line on reservation dogs? They want it all back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, that was great. Um, I just want to say, and this is just a local thing in Missoula, but, um, you know, we all, um, I guess, are suffering our mental health, you know, our lack of being social, et cetera, et cetera, because of the pandemic. Well, there's a all indigenous comedy lineup on February 17th in Missoula, Montana at the Zootown Arts Community Center. And um, I don't know if y'all know Lenny Peppers, um, her daughter or her mom is Ray Peppers from a representative and um, my son Thomas is a new stand-up comedian, and there's a few others, Michael Beers and Mars Sandoval. Those are the ones I know. But yeah, I would just encourage you all to attend that if you're local in Missoula, um, and just you know have some some good laughs. We all we need more laughs in our life. <clears throat> yeah, I mean that's how we survive, like Native people, like. I mean, all those really crappy things are happening, but I mean, at least I can make a joke about it, which I think I do too much of, but can you do? <laughs> um, but yeah, alrighty. Well, um, again, I guess thank you all for um, joining us um, for our last panel of our 16th Annual Women's Policy Leadership Institute. Um, so much gratitude and appreciation for our panelists this evening, um, just doing the work, really important work. Um, uh, again, like I said um, before, we um, ask you to complete our evaluation 
um, complete that and you will be entered to win a visa, a visa gift card or a signed copy of what we don't talk about when we talk about fat, which was written by our keynote. Um, I expect glowing reviews on this panel, just kidding. Um, but um, yeah, we really do appreciate those evals because like I said, they help us improve. Um, and yeah, um, I, sh there's, I feel like there's like something I should add, but I don't have anything. Um, Can I make a closing statement very quickly? <laughs> I didn't have anything to like advertise because I don't live in Montana and for the time being. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming and listening to um, us. Um, this was such a, I'm very honored to be surrounded by um, the Native woman that I got to um, talk to today. Y'all are just like such awesome role models. Um, and also um, wanted to go back to a statement that I made earlier of how like when I accepted this job, I didn't think that like I was old enough or like had enough experience to get into the world of just like politics. But like now realizing that like, I always like had viewed politics as like, oh, I can like start making change when like I'm on council or like running as for like Congress um, in Montana. But like doing this job and also just like reaching out to like friends that um, are back on the reservation. Um, the like biggest like changes that we can make um, for our reservation come in like the small everyday things, whether that's like learning our language or like calling out like your creepy friends for talking to girls in high school. Like those really are like the big things that make a difference. Um, and yeah, you're gonna tell that I studied ethnic studies in college, um, but the our res, reses are only as beautiful as we make them. And there is always a um, better future for Montana and for our tribes. Yes, I like wanna clap, I'm gonna clap. <laughs> um, but you, you brought up something that um, we've been kind of talking about like a little bit here at Montana Women Vote and that's taking this institute to tribal communities. Like, um, you know, someone at, the high school in Rocky Boy reached out and was like, can you bring your institute here? Because, um, you know, high school students, we were all high school students. Online things um, aren't really the greatest um, ways to present information sometimes. And so, um, yeah, it's just something that we've been kind of talking about. Um, so um, I'm hoping that, you know, our panelists today will join us um, once we, once we do that, um, but yeah. And I mean, all this would be tailored to tribal communities, but um, yeah. Oh yeah, and if y'all um, need register to vote, let us know. We do voter registration stuff. I guess that's my ask. Like, make sure you're registered to vote at your current address. We don't have same day voter election day anymore. So get that, get that taken care of sooner rather than later. Thank you, everyone.